Thank you for joining us for episode two. The theme of this episode is the history of fusion research with Dr. Stephen Dean. Dr. Dean is head of the Fusion Power Associates, which he has led for 37 years. This group has been a key advocate for fusion research inside Washington, D.C. In this episode, he tells his story and we weave it into the greater history of fusion research in America. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the Fusion Podcast. Modern fusion research grew out of traditional fission research in the 1940s and 50s. That was first achieved in Chicago in 1942. On December 2nd, 1942, man achieved here the first self-sustaining chain reaction and thereby initiated the controlled release of nuclear energy. Shortly after the Second World War, the United States started pursuing fusion research in secret. The code name for this program was Project Sherwood. It's at this point that Dr. Dean enters our story. When I was a junior a physics major in college, I came across a book called Project Sherwood by Amasa Bishop, who was the first head of the U.S. fusion program and wrote this book in 1958, part of the declassification of fusion worldwide. It seemed to me like this was an area in which one could make a difference in the world if it came to pass and was successful and which was in a very early stage. And so as a young person looking for a place in which to make a career in physics type stuff. And uh, so that's what first got me interested in it. I was fortunate enough to get some great career opportunities. When I got my master's degree at uh, MIT, I actually get a job working in the fusion office at the Atomic Energy Commission in Washington. The Atomic Energy Commission was the forerunner to the U.S. Department of Energy. And here in Washington, D.C., is the headquarters of the United States Atomic Energy Commission. Here, the work of planning and unifying and evaluating our atomic research program is carried on. And so that sort of set me right in the center of things and gave me the opportunities to travel around to all the sites, uh, both nationally and internationally, that were working on fusion and meeting the best people in the field. And so, you know, my interest in the field got solidified. While I was doing that, I got my PhD at Maryland in physics. The early players in fusion were the U.S., Britain, and Russia. At that time, research was happening along several lines of inquiry at several locations on several different concepts simultaneously. Basically, we didn't know what to focus on. Fusion got a huge boost in the early 1970s with the oil crisis. This is NBC Nightly News, Wednesday, October 17th. Good evening. The Middle East war produced developments all over the world today. The oil-producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon. They will reduce oil production by 5% a month until the Israelis withdraw from occupied territories. There were diplomatic maneuvers at the United Nations, in Washington, and in Cairo. That was now in the early 70s. I was fortunate enough to be at the Atomic Energy Commission in the fusion office when the energy crisis hit. Good evening. Tonight I want to have an unpleasant talk with you about a problem that's unprecedented in our history. With the exception of preventing war, this is the greatest challenge that our country will face during our lifetime. The energy crisis has not yet overwhelmed us. But it will, if we do not act quick. Many of these proposals will be unpopular. Some will cause you to put up with inconveniences and to make sacrifices. The most important thing about these proposals is that the alternative may be a national catastrophe. The government said, we're going to become energy independent and we've got to really do all of these energy programs seriously. 
Richard Nixon and then Jimmy Carter decided that the, the government should expand all their work in energy. So, you know, our budget started to grow. So I was able, again, to be fortunate enough in my career to be right there when the budget went up like $30 million a year to $300 million a year. So it was a very exciting time. Three early concepts were the pinch, the tokamak, and the magnetic mirror. I found a great documentary from the 70s documenting each concept. The pinch was the first machine to ever get controlled nuclear fusion at Los Alamos National Labs in 1958. Basically, current was dumped down a metal tube, causing a magnetic inward force crushing the plasma to fusion conditions. The next voice you're going to hear is Dr. Fred Ribe, who's describing a pinch machine. Here at Los Alamos, our main approach is pulsed high density systems. At Los Alamos, the philosophy is to quickly shock heat the plasma to fusion temperatures and densities before it becomes lost. Early experiments in straight devices solved many technical problems but all suffered from the plasma leaking out the ends of the tube. Though the pinch came first, it was ultimately the tokamak which became the worldwide fusion heavyweight. You can imagine the tokamak as a pinch machine looped together, a giant racetrack. Hot plasma races around it in an endless loop. When the atoms come together at those temperatures, they can fuse together. This seems like a good way to confine our fusion plasma, except that the plasma can escape from the ends of the cylinder. The easiest way to close off the ends of a cylinder is to bend it around and put the ends together, creating the shape of a torus. It's a shape like a donut. Charged particles, either protons or electrons, traveling around the torus are gently guided by the field around and around. The third concept is the magnetic mirror. This concept uses magnetic fields to reflect the path of plasma. When two mirrors face each other, ideally, plasma bounces back and forth in an infinite loop. The next voice you're going to hear is Dr. Fred Cozine, who worked on mirrors for many years and is a hero of mine. I've been at this game here in Livermore since 1953. That's over 20 years. I've worked on several experiments, including Toy Top, 2X1, 2X2, and now we're on the air with a new machine. The Livermore machine is the largest, most advanced mirror device in the world. The theory behind the mirror approach is to bounce the plasma particles back and forth many times before they are lost out the ends of the machine. With many machines, institutions, and concepts involved, it was time to plan for the future. I was given the opportunity to lead a community planning study that we published in 1976 that said we could get the fusion by the year 2000 for $20 billion. And then in 1980, the Congress passed a bill codifying that into law, saying that we would do that. And Jimmy Carter signed that law. So, you know, at that point, I thought everything was really going according to plan. I wanted to be right involved in it. So what I did was I left the government and I formed Fusion Power Associates with a couple of other people, Nick Prawl and Al Chivalpiece, and we started what we hope would be the beginnings of a, a shift in emphasis in the program from labs and universities into industry. During the early 80s, I was in that position of organizing the industries. That was all great. And then, of course, we had the problem in the early 80s that shortly after Jimmy Carter signed it into law, Ronald Reagan was elected president. And he said, well, it isn't the government's job to do energy. It's the private sector. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. 
And just maybe as I was about to lose hope, because I was losing all our industrial participants in Fusion Power Associates, Ronald Reagan made peace with the Gorbachev in 1987, and they agreed to build the first fusion reactor, <laughs> which was eventually called ITER. And that didn't allow me then to quit at that point, so I got really interested and thought things were really going to go now. ITER is currently under construction in France. It is the world's largest tokamak. It is being built by a consortium of nations from around the world. Now we're designing a large experimental tokamak, which when operating should produce as much power as a standard power generating station, about 1,000 megawatts. If this power was completely converted into electricity, it would be enough to briefly run 100,000 homes. The name of this next experimental machine will be the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER. Another major event in fusion history happened only a few years after the ITER agreement was signed. I asked Dr. Dean about the cold fusion fiasco. There have been a couple of uh, false alarms put out by people who claim to have solved the fusion program, and, and these got a lot of publicity. So you can see that there's an appetite for this information, but the only people that have put out these great claims have been people who were not able to then follow up with proof. Probably the most famous one was the Hans and Fleischmann cold fusion thing in the 80s. It got on the cover of Time magazine, on the cover of Newsweek, all the newspapers. There was a congressional hearing with television cameras there. People like Edward Teller even came out and said, well, maybe it's possible. <laughs> Using atoms. Some of the world's leading researchers have spent decades and millions of dollars trying to achieve this in the laboratory. Scientists in Utah tonight believe they have taken a big step forward in a little test tube. CBS News correspondent John Blackstone begins our coverage of... If what is happening in these test tubes is indeed controlled nuclear fusion, as the scientists who set up this experiment believe, then this laboratory may one day be known as the birthplace of cheap, clean, and abundant energy. I was actually on the CBS Evening News shortly after that. Science has long known how to make atoms fuse at extraordinarily high temperatures. But the problem for decades has been to control such fusion and put it to practical use. I'm very excited that we've found a new fundamental process that's never been observed before for how fusion might be made. On the other hand, it's clear that this process is very small scale. There was no obvious way that it could have been possible to do this. Basically, it's something that looked like a car battery in your kitchen without high temperature. You know, from the normal physics, there didn't seem to be any way that that could be possible. But, you know, Edward Teller came out and said, well, maybe there's a tunneling effect of some sort, you know, some kind of quantum effect that had never been seen before, and there's no physics for it yet, but there will be. So there were a lot of people, both in our program and, and elsewhere. You know, I consulted for one of the oil companies who believed this might be real. And since the oil companies have research laboratories with a lot of chemists, and these guys were chemists, they all jumped on the bandwagon and tried to do it. So there were a lot of people, and the government itself at the national laboratories tried to duplicate these things. So there were an awful lot of attempts to duplicate this effect in the U.S. and around the world. And uh, nobody could duplicate it. But nevertheless, it was a huge public relations event that brought fusion to the attention of the American people. And people still, when they call me and talk to me about fusion, always bring up, is cold fusion still a possibility and is it still alive and so on? You know, the good thing was that a lot of people were open-minded enough to think, well, maybe it's possible even it seems like it isn't. So when people make these claims, if they got any kind of credentials at all, people don't discount them totally anymore. There will always be scientists that will say, well, no, these people are stupid, it can never work. And so you can find people who will say that, but you can also usually find people who say, no, let, let's take a look at it. You know, there's good and bad there, but it's not all bad. I think that it's healthy that there are entrepreneurs out there that try to do it a different way, try to do it a simpler way or a cheaper way or a faster way. Cold fusion cast a long shadow over this field into the 90s. This was a period of time when interest in fusion cooled off, 
and Dr. Dean was there to witness it all. There were ups and downs in the 90s where things started to go. You know, where there were committees that said, yeah, fusion was important, let's do it. And then there were budget crises in Congress where things got shut down. And we had Republicans for a while, and then we had Democrats for a while, and then we went back to Republicans for a while. And they do always question what the previous administration thinks is important and come up with their own thing that they think was important. You know, there were times when people said, well, it's not an energy fuel problem, but it's a global warming problem. And you know, various groups said, well, that's important, and other groups said, well, we don't believe in it. So we've never been able to get everybody on board on both parties to say we've got to develop a carbon-free energy source, and fusion is a, a good bet, and, and it's going to cost a lot more money than we're putting into it, and let's do it. The closest thing we've come to it is ITER, and that happened because... Gorbachev, the Russians and the U.S., and then they got the French involved at a high level. They said, this is a very important area, but it's very expensive, and none of us wants to pay to do it by ourselves. And so let's get a lot of countries together to do it together. And they formed the seven parties, if you count Europe as one, to do fusion. A global collaboration was formed consisting of the U.S., the European Union, Japan, Russia, China, India, and South Korea. Member nations are building a prototype fusion power plant known as ITER. Inside the tokamak, high-powered radio waves at several frequencies and highly energetic beams of neutral atoms will heat and control the plasma or the fuel in the reaction process. The plasma is an ionized gas made up of the hydrogen isotopes deuterium and tritium. For many years, the tokamak has been the most well-funded fusion concept in the world. I asked Dr. Dean why. It's the concept that has had the most success. No other concept has had the performance success that the, even the small early tokamaks had that created what was called in one of the reviews a bandwagon effect around the world. When the Russians got good confinement in the tokamak, when most everybody else over here was looking to try to do it in stellarators and magnetic mirrors, which didn't have good confinement, and all of a sudden the Russians had good confinement, everybody started building tokamaks. And all these tokamaks turned out to get good results people build bigger ones. And so all around the world, people kept building bigger and bigger ones, and they all seemed to work, and they all worked better. We got things like the ideal ignition temperature was achieved in the tokamak for the first time. The Lawson criterion for energy balance of density times the confinement time was achieved and the only time in the world in the tokamak. Because they kept building new ones and bigger ones and better ones, they kept getting more performance. And nothing else, even when these things were being funded a little bit, Nothing else uh, was getting this kind of performance. As the tokamak emerged as the dominant fusion idea, the U.S. decided to transition from a homegrown effort to a worldwide partnership. I asked Dr. Dean about this. So fusion became a thing not for the U.S., but for the world to decide to do as an international venture. And so U.S. then sort of said, well, we're just a part of that. You know, we don't have to have our own policy to develop fusion, and therefore we don't really need to put a lot more money into it right away, and uh, we'll watch and see how this international thing goes. And so that's what's been happening the last almost 15 years now. There doesn't seem to be a groundswell within the U.S. to do it ourselves. We just watch the international committees, and they're doing is building this big 500 megawatt thermal fusion power plant, which is a substantial step forward for fusion if they get it built and operating. Can't say that just because the fusion policy ebbed and flowed here in the U.S. that it wasn't moving forward. It was moving forward, but it was moving forward slowly under the guise of a international venture. So all along the way. Whenever things sort of got bad, a few years later, things started looking up again. So I never lost hope. You know, I hung in there. I asked Dr. Dean how we could drum up public support when it is too low and tamp down expectations when they are too high. 
I think the only way that we get the attention in the public is when we have a major step forward. You only have these major step forwards when you bring on a new facility that's got more capability than the facilities you've had in the past. The newest facility to come online in the world is the W7X Stellarator in Germany. A Stellarator is a twisted tokamak. You see, a common problem in tokamaks is that plasma gets scattered to the outside and eventually slams into the walls. The Stellarator attempts to beat this problem by twisting the ring so that plasma is continually scattered in towards the center. It was first dreamed up by Lyman J. Spitzer in the 1960s at Princeton University. The Germans built this Stellarator that was designed by a supercomputer and turned it on at the end of 2015. Meet the Wendelstein 7X Stellarator. It looks like a mad scientist's project, and it sounds like one too. Most fusion reactors are donut-shaped tokamaks, the key is to create a powerful magnetic cage to contain the hydrogen. The Stellarator designed in Germany has even more twists and turns to make it easier to keep this plasma under control. You may have noticed that I'm brushing by several important concepts. In subsequent episodes, I hope to go into detail about each specific concept, explaining how these ideas work. In the next episode, we continue to talk to Dr. Stephen Dean about the history of fusion research. One group or one person comes up with a good idea. He's not credible enough all by himself. What do you know about nuclear power? Honestly, it makes me think of Homer Simpson. Homer Simpson? Yes. Plus, I just bought donuts, so... So stick around. I want to thank Daniel Whalen. Robert Steinhaus, Tyler Jordan, and Fusion supporters everywhere. <laughs>